Okay, we're going to switch gears a little bit and move uh, kind of away from a little bit of clinical applications. Uh, and with the next talk from Sarah Dudgeon, who is a CBB uh, PhD student, uh, she is going to talk about quantum click detection and biologic graph networks. Take it away. Thank you. Uh, today, I'm going to talk about quantum applications for graph networks. And the reason we're interested in this is because we're part of the NIH's Bridge to AI program, where the goal of the program is to generate flagship data sets and accelerate biomedical AI and ML. And the way that we will achieve this is by generating high quality data sets that use common standards are well documented and are publicly accessible to enable uh, broad and ethical development of AI applications. And our specific project within Bridge to AI is uh, called Cell Maps for AI. Cell Maps for AI or CM for AI is um, centered around generating a cell map, which is a roadmap to how our cells function. And these maps can be used in a variety of areas from early stage drug discovery through personalized medicine to predict things like drug response and patient outcome. And uh, one other exciting way that cell maps have been used by our collaborators is to build visible neural networks to predict drug response in cancer. And the visible neural network approach provides a level of transparency which can't be achieved in traditional black box AI. And it allows users to leverage the cell map to then go forth and explain why the drug response prediction is being made. The way that these cell maps are created is by performing unsupervised clustering on a graph of protein-protein interaction data. The graph is created from a multimodal set of immunofluorescence and mass spec data. And after these raw data on the left go through a, uh, a single layer of embeddings per protein, they create a graph of protein proximities or distance between proteins within a cell. And these distances are then used in community detection and click detection algorithms to identify cellular components and subcomponents of the cell. To identify these components, um, a set of community and click detection algorithms are used. And this figure uh, represents a very basic graph where the circles are the nodes and the lines are the edges or the relationships between the nodes. And in protein-protein interaction graphs, the nodes are individual proteins and the edges represent, again, those distances between the two proteins. So to generate the final cell map, what we look for are communities which are highly connected and clicks which are fully connected um, within the, the protein graph. And if you look at, um, communities one and three, you'll see that they are not completely connected while community two is a click. It is fully connected. And the communities and clicks within the cell map represent cellular components and subcomponents found therein. The final output of these algorithms generate our cell maps. And this figure is one such cell map, which is generated by our collaborators. And it consists of the music data set, which contains 667 proteins. And using unsupervised click and community detection approaches, uh, they were able to identify known cellular components in yellow, as well as uh, putative, uh, potentially novel components within the cell identified in purple. And uh, one major limitation that's important to point out here is that these algorithms are uh, computationally intensive. And uh, of course, because they're models, they have the potential to misclassify certain proteins into the wrong clusters or subclusters. So 
Because of this, we wanted to explore potential quantum algorithms that could improve the efficiency and or accuracy of community and click detection. The reason that quantum offers these potential improvements is that quantum computers use a completely different approach to computing. Instead of relying on classical bits, which encode a, either a zero or a one, they use a uh, quantum bit or a qubit, which is represented in this block sphere on the right. And in the quantum state, qubits encode data in both a zero and a one state at the same time. And in doing so, this increases both compute capacity and algorithmic search space for machine learning algorithms. And this increased search space allows quantum algorithms to simultaneously evaluate algorithmic solutions. So we first wanted to test how well quantum community detection performed compared to classical algorithms. And to do this, we used a benchmark data set that we all know and love. Um, this data set is commonly used for community detection. It's called the Karate Club data set. It consists of 34 individuals who join one of two clubs. Each individual is a single node and each club is represented by a color. Edges represent known lines of communication before club members uh, join their respective clubs. And the benchmarking goal is to accurate, accurately predict which member will join which club. And it's important to note here that the best performing classical algorithms are able to do so, except uh, they continually misclassify one person. So we did the same study uh, using a quantum approach and we were able to actually repeat those results. We correctly identified everyone to their respective clubs aside from one individual. And what we garnered from this was quantum community detection can perform just as well as classical methods. But uh, we wanted to know if this could scale to the size of our cell maps. Um, so we further reviewed the literature to see how these algorithms scale with larger, more complex data on current quantum hardware. Um, and in this study done by Rosbinski et al, um, scientists look at three data sets, the first being that same karate data set, and then two larger brain connectome data sets. And they performed both quantum and community detection and, uh, I'm sorry, quantum community de detection and classical community detection. And um, you'll see on the x-axis, they have the three different data sets. And on the y-axis is a representation of the relative percent increase in algorithmic performance of the quantum approach as compared to the classical approach. And similar to our results, there was a minimal difference in algorithm performance when using the karate data set. However, when they were using the larger AAL90 and Dosenbach data sets, they found statistically increased performance when using quantum as opposed to a standard method. And these findings kind of reinforced our excitement for using quantum community detection to create our cell maps. However, community detection is only part of the last step in cell map creation. The other part is that click detection, which I uh, mentioned previously. So we wanted to again search the literature for um, the current state of click detection in uh, quantum versus uh, classical approaches. And in this study by Shapui et al., um, they assessed the performance of a quantum click detection algorithm using maximum click size as a sort of proxy for um, representation that larger clicks um, should indicate better performance. And in this figure from their results section, you can see that the performance of the quantum algorithm is represented as a red line where the other colors are um, non-quantum 
algorithm approaches. And what they showed was in smaller graphs, there was not any uh, major difference among the algorithm performance, but uh, for the larger graphs, uh, where we see the red line really standing out above the the other colors, quantum performance really exceeded that of the non-quantum approaches. So, uh, in I'm sorry, <laughs> these results uh, suggested the potential to increase uh, algorithm performance by incorporating the quantum approach to our cell map generation project. And in conclusion, uh, what I'd like to send you home with is the idea that quantum community detection can perform just as well as classical approaches and quantum click detection may offer novel solutions as compared to those found via classical methods. So I encourage you to, as you continue in your studies, perhaps broaden your scope to include quantum approaches. Specifically for our work, our next steps include using the MIMIC data set, uh, the first cell map that I described, as a benchmark data set as we evaluate quantum capacity to improve efficiency or accuracy when we go to a cluster uh, protein structures. And uh, lastly, we'll take it from there and we'll start using the quantum click detection to be uh, a, a tool as we develop our larger cell maps and expand those to from hundreds uh, and to thousands of, of proteins included in the cell map. So thank you very much. Maybe a question coming? Yeah. Start with that. Really great talk. Thank you um, for sharing that question. So would you be able to tell us a little bit more about these visible neural networks and specifically how they're visible? Yeah, yeah, that's um, a lot of information that I glossed over rather quickly. The idea of a visible neural network is that instead of a um, standardized approach to your neural network where you have nodes in a layer and they're all potentially connected to subsequent nodes in the next layer and the next layer following, what you'll instead do is use the architecture as defined by a cell map or a, a, a sublocation within the cell map. And you'll use that to actually lay out the meaning of nodes in each layer and their connections to subsequent layers. Um, and our colleagues at um, uh, UCSD were able to use a visible neural ne network to uh, predict, uh, predict drug response um, quite accurately, actually. It was really impressive work. And um, on top of that, we, they were able to garner some some biological information just based on the weights and biases that come out of a final tuned model. Other questions from the, uh, one question. So I'm, I'm sure that a lot of the audience is trying to figure out how you get your hands on like quantum computing stuff. So you can kind of unpack that process or kind of how you all have those relationships. Yeah, um, my, <laughs> Uh, maybe I'll call it a descent into quantum um, was a little challenging. It's an overwhelming space and it's changing every day, much like everything we're studying here. And there's a lot to choose from when you get into it. What we're specifically using is D-Wave quantum annealing services. Um, Quantum annealing is a little bit different than some other more classical quantum architectures, which will use um, uh, use a gate based method, um, and you can you can map something like a, a neural network onto a gate based method, but you cannot do that in a quantum annealing method. However, when it comes to quantum annealing, um, they're particularly good at quadratic based uh, problems. And graph minimization or minimization over a graph um, or maximization, it, those are 
quadratic based problems that are particularly well suited to a quantum annealer. So I know we've all heard this when it comes to data sets or when it comes to model selection that fit for purpose, it still applies here. And before you get into the application of quantum in your work, make sure that you go through the due diligence of finding a fit for purpose solution for your work. Great, I think we have. Yeah, one question here, a practical question. How many qubits uh, you have in your quantum computer you used for this? I'm sorry, say that? How many qubits uh, computer you have for this work? Yeah. And uh, second one is, uh, uh, do you program in uh, Qskit or some other language? Great question. So um, again, uh, okay, uh, as far as qubits, qubits are mostly uh, well, the greatest number of qubits. Um, and I dropped this slide for time, but the, the most qubits in, per system that you can find right now is in annealing systems. But again, that's not the reason we chose quantum annealing for this work. Um, it was really that fit for purpose reason that we chose quantum annealing. It doesn't, more qubits in a system or in a QPU doesn't necessarily mean a better QPU. There are ways to measure um, the goodness, the, uh, I'll call it goodness of, of a QPU. Um, and qubits is just one of those metrics that goes into that measure of, of how good a computing system is. Um, and then to ask you, answer your second question about Qiskit, I don't code in Qiskit because Qiskit is mapped onto a uh, gate-based approach. This is totally separate. Yeah. One, one more question. So I have no knowledge in this area, so I hope I'm not going to make myself look really silly here. But my question is, what's your biggest challenge and hurdle before you can actually apply this to, for example, drug discovery or um, identification of novel targets? Uh, you may have answered that in your second but last quite answer when you're talking about finding fit for model, but um, please. Yeah, yeah, I think um, I would say for sure it's the fit for purpose algorithm selection and QPU selection that's going to be the largest hurdle. But when it comes to actually making these, um, these uh, methods for drug discovery, I think um, once you have a solution that you trust and, and you get there by using the benchmarking approach, like I showed with the karate club and like we're going to do with the uh, music data set. It's the same thing. You need to validate your approach first. So we'll do that. But the, the more challenging part actually, both financially and temporally then becomes the validation in the lab. So I, I would assume that um, once you get through the steps of setting everything up, for a quantum approach, you're, you should have a fairly simple time in running the model. It's just uh, after that, your validation, as always, it's it's lab costs that will get in the way. Well, Rohan did mention earlier on, so I, I'm the director of the Blavatnik Fund. If there is a solution there that we can help with that, please come speak to us. Um. Wonderful, thank you.